Then the topic of this talk, MHD and ITER. So why do we study MHD, magnetohydrodynamics in ITER? I will discuss uh, well, the, the issues that ITER has with MHD. And then MHD simulations, uh, which we apply to try to better understand what the problems are and how we can solve them. And then I, I at the end, show some recent applications uh, of the work we do at, uh, at ITER on MHD simulations. So the, the picture is Ether. Uh, you see the little man here. He's very well hidden, but there he is. <laughs> it's, um, <coughs> but I'll uh, go on to that. The first, the, the mission goals of Ether. Why do we build the machine? It is the first machine that is supposed to actually uh, amplify the energy you put in by a factor of 10. So it should produce energy. It will not produce electricity, just energy. Uh, and the aim is to do that for a time about 300 to 500 seconds in the initial phase. And in a later stage, uh, but that is after 2030 or so, the aim is to do that in steady state and then produce uh, an amplification factor of 5. And then, of course, we always retain the possibility of exploring a controlled ignition, which means an amplification factor of the energy you put in by a factor of 30. Uh, it's not just a physics experiment, it's also a technology platform to develop the, the technology you need for a fusion power plant. And that means you need to integrate all existing technologies uh, that we use. Uh, I'll show some. Test the components and mostly testing the tritium breeding blanket model. So the, uh, the, the, the fuel for a fusion uh, reaction, of course, is deuterium and tritium. Tritium doesn't occur naturally or very little, so it needs to be uh, made in place. And that is done in the tritium breeding modules. And this will be studied for the first time on a, on a, on a tokamak, on a real machine. So what does the machine look like? This is the same picture, but now uh, with some descriptions. Uh, do I have a pointer? Is it? Uh, I guess this so. No. OK, good. Let's pause. <laughs> OK, so. <coughs> Is it? Oh, I did the wrong button. Which one? Ah, press F4. Okay. Okay. So this is the ITER machine. Uh, the, the tokamak itself is here, the vacuum vessel. So inside is, is a vacuum, and the plasma will be. Oops. Let's say four, three, four. Uh, the plasma will be here. No, oh, so much fun. <laughs> so the plasma will be uh, here, in, uh, inside this ring here. Uh, this is the vacuum vessel. Then there's a, a system of magnetic field coils. So there's a, the toroidal field coil, so the field that goes in the, in the symmetric direction like this, is made by the coils which you see here in blue, these, around here. Then there are poroidal field coils, which make the field uh, in, the, in, the, in the plane uh, cut through the machine, which are the six ones, which is uh, one here, two, three, four, five, and six. And they go around in the large circle. And then there are the error field correction coils, because the, the quality of the field needs to be to an extreme precision, up to uh, 10 minus 4, 10 minus 5 in accuracy, on in symmetry. And to obtain that, you need, need the coils themselves to be very precise, but you also need correction coils. So these are coils that are specifically put there to, to cancel out errors that are occurring from, from construction, basically. Yeah. So that the field they produce inside the, 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 inside the machine is very precise, Axisymmetric, so totally symmetric. And then you see the uh, here the brown blocks are the blocks that shield the the machine from the plasma. So the neutrons it captures most of the oops, most of the neutrons. Oh, I forgot an important uh, magnetic field. Nah, uh, sorry. Uh, the, I forgot the central solenoid, which of course also a large coil, which is the coil that drives the current into inside the plasma. Uh, uh, <coughs> I don't know how much you know about the tokamak machine, but this is the the field of this coil will be ramped up and down during the during the discharge, and it drives by a transformer effect the current inside the plasma. So it induces an electric field inside the, the torus, 
and creates a plasma. So then there's the diverter, which is an important part, which is, will be in tungsten. Oops, now I lost my mouse here as well. Oh. <laughs> okay, you see the, the arrows. In the bottom is the tungsten, is where the plasma touches the wall. Uh, and tungsten only melts at uh, 2,700 degrees, that's why it was chosen. Also, it doesn't contaminate the plasma as much. What else do we see? We see the cryostat, which is the whole, the big vessel around the whole machine. And inside the cryostat, it will be vacuum, and this is to to shield, uh, well, as an insulator, basically, because the coils will all be superconducting. Uh, you need to uh, prevent heat from outside coming into the, onto the machine. So this is, again, the coils, because they're so important. These are, the, as I said before, there are 48 superconducting coils. Um, they're organized like this. Uh, typical fields are... Uh, I have to read it myself. 12 Tesla for the throttle field, but this is the maximum field on the conductor. So we're exactly... Uh, I should not point to the screen. <laughs> but okay, at the highest field is uh, about 12 Tesla. But the main field inside the plasma is 5.3 Tesla. And then there are the other system, maybe an important number is the... Not important, but is the total energy that you put into the machine in the magnetic field is enormous. It's 41 gigajoule of energy. Compare that to the energy that will be in the plasma is only uh, a third of a gigajoule. So there's much more uh, magnetic energy in the system than there is uh, kinetic energy in the plasma. Just to show you that uh, things are actually being made, uh, this is a picture again of one coil out of 18. And if you cut a coil like uh, in the picture, you see that it's made of uh, what is called pancakes and lots of cables that lie into plates with, with grooves. So there you see a typical plate, a radial plate is called, and the superconducting cable is lying inside these grooves. And this is necessary to, to uh, due to the forces on the, on the coils, of course. The coils themselves want to expand when they apply a magnetic field, and you have to put them inside a very solid material to keep them in place. So this is one of the first uh, radial plates that's being produced. The uh, actual production is starting now in Italy. And they make about uh, one a month, and they have to make uh, quite a lot of them. The conductors, the conductors, the, so the superconductors are uh, almost ready, 95% complete now. They were made by all partners of ITER. The structures is being made now, uh, and the coils themselves will be uh, made by Europe and Japan, each uh, nine and ten coils. Just to show you the other side, this was in April 2014. You can see, uh, I'll try to point. No, uh, I lost my mouse here. <laughs> so, okay. So here is the office building, which is now ready for uh, one year. We moved in last year. Um, this is the Tokamak side. Here will be the Tokamak, very small. But this is the, the basement, basically, now being made. This will be the assembly hall, where the machine will be pre-assembled before it's moved into here. This is the building where they make the cryostat. The cryostat is 30 meters by 30 meters, so it's too big to be made uh, elsewhere. It just needs to be assembled on site. And also the polaroidal field cars will be made on site, will be in this building. Uh, to give you an impression of the size, this building is about three uh, football fields uh, large. So it's really enormous. This is a site where they make the concrete on site. And okay, here you can see CEA, Torre Supra. It's just here on the, on the other side of the fence. So this is this, the, the inside the, the Tokamak pit. So this is where the Tokamak is being built. They're now building the second layer of the basement. So underneath here are 500 pillars. And top of these pillars is a rubber sheet, well, rubber and metal sheets uh, for seismic control. So, and on top of that, they built, now built the real basement. So the whole basement the, so can move during an earthquake so that the machine is protected. In this picture, they have done now one-ninth of the, of the floor here. At the moment, they have done three more, so it's almost half finished now. This will be finished with the basement uh, in the end of August. And this is what it should look like, uh, the building of the, the Tokamak. And, uh, and the, so the Tokamak will be here, the assembly hall will be here uh, at the end of uh, or around 2020. This is just to give you an indication of the timescales. So the machine is being built now, mostly the components are being built elsewhere. They will be assembled onto the site in the coming years. And we expect first plasma now to be in 2022. 
So this is a delay of about two and a half years with respect to the original schedule. And this is mostly due to the buildings being late. The just, just building concrete uh, buildings uh, seems to be the most difficult part of, of building ETA. So what are ETA plasmas like? <coughs> This is the typical plasma that we expect to operate during in steady state, so for 300 to 500 seconds. So it will produce, it's predicted to produce an amplification factor of 10, as I said. The current will be 15 mega amperes. And it will operate in what is called an ELMI H mode. I don't know if that was discussed last week, what an H mode is and what ELMs are. But if you look at, for example, the expected temperature profile as a function of radius, you see that the, uh, in the center we have about 30 kilo electron volt, uh, hundreds of millions of degrees. But at the edge, there's a sharp, uh, short, short region of about six, five, six centimeters, where there will be a very large gradient in the temperature and also in the density. And this is called what is called the H mode. Uh, so the, the, this region corresponds to a reduction in turbulent transport. So the energy confinement is very good here locally and gives you very large gradients here which means that your energy confinement increases by a factor of two just by this effect. And ETA needs to operate in this regime. But the disadvantage is that you have MAG instabilities, which I'll not discuss much today, which are called ELMS, edge localized modes, because they occur at the edge. But this is the regime that ETA operates in. So the plasma energy will be about 350 megajoule. The volume is about 800 cubic meters. The externally applied heating power, so there will be neutral beams, so neutral particles will be injected at high energy to heat the plasma, also ICRH, so ion cyclotron heating, and electron uh, cyclotron heating, will, these are the three heating powers. We can inject up to uh, 60 megawatts, uh, but we think 40 to 50 will be enough, and then the fusion power will be 400 to 500 megawatts. Of this power, of course, uh, most goes to the neutrons, and neutrons just escape, they don't heat the plasma. And there will be about 100 megawatts of alpha powers, so helium, uh, fast helium particles, which will heat the plasma uh, also, will contribute to the heating. As I said, 300 to 500 seconds. Uh, ETA needs to operate at very high density, and this is for several reasons. It's mostly to, to, to protect the plasma, to protect the machine where the plasma uh, touches the machine, you need to have very high density and low temperature so that you don't damage the machine too much. And that means we have to operate close to a density limit. <coughs> uh, okay, this is... Uh, okay, I will not discuss further. Uh, one other thing is that the ETA machine is so large compared to present machines that you cannot fuel the plasma, so uh, fueling means uh, uh, adding density to the plasma in in machines that we have now, the plasma is relatively up to a meter big, and you can fuel the plasma with, ga with gas valves. So you inject gas from the, from the sides, from anywhere. But in ether, this gas is ionized well before it enters the plasma, so it, it does not contribute to the fueling. So ether will be the first machine that will inject, well, uh, needs to inject uh, pellets, so uh, ice cubes of a typically three cubic millimeters at high speed, about 300 meters per second they will be injected from the side with a frequency of uh, up to 10 hertz. And they will uh, reach up to well, 10 to 20 centimeters into the plasma, and this will fuel, fuel the plasmas. And then, okay, we need to operate in detached diverter. This is a bit technical, but this basically means that you have to have very high density and very low temperatures in the diverter. And this is done by uh, adding locally impurities, neon, for example, which radiate most of the energy away, so that the temperature actually at the, at the diverter Will only be uh, below ten. Will be below ten eV of, well, compared to a plasma of uh, thirty thousand eV. Uh, okay, this is so. This is the basic scenario. There are also hybrid scenarios and advanced scenarios. They will be used to make long, quasi steady state plasmas. But this will be uh, after the initial ETH operation. So, in a very long time, fifteen years or more from now. So then I come to, to MHD. I hope you all had some introduction to MHD last week uh, in the course, but maybe not all. So MHD is two things. It depends on who you talk to, what, what people mean with MHD. If you talk to a theoretical person, uh, maybe like me, then MHD means the theoretical model as invented by Hans Alvein a long time ago now. And it's a description of the plasma as an electric, electrically conducting fluid embedded in a magnetic field. 
So this is combining Navier-Stokes equations, just the normal fluid equations with pre-Maxwell's equations. So really it's a 19th century model, but it's really very, very accurate and very useful for describing a phenomenon that we see in tokamak plasmas. So it really only describes uh, conservation of mass, momentum, energy, uh, and magnetic uh, flux, magnetic field energy. And the applications you probably know as well as me is uh, plasmas, but also solar physics, astrophysics, magnetosphere, dynamos, and the list goes on and on. But if you talk to an experimentalist and you ask him what is MHD, then he, th he thinks that, well, in his view, MHD is in our large-scale movements of the plasma, so instabilities of the plasma, which he observes and normally are detr detrimental for the plasma. So they, they destroy either locally the plasma or globally. And depending on the type of instability that we get, uh, we have, uh, well, we need to, uh, I'll, I'll come to that, I'll discuss that in more detail. But okay, as I said, in experiment, it refers to large-scale magnetic instabilities in, in the plasma. Large-scale means they go from, uh, let's say, 10% of the minor radius to the, the whole minor radius and the whole plasma. So the <coughs> these instabilities are driven by the pressure gradients and current gradients. And the effect of the instabilities is that it limits the global pressure that you can have in a plasma in the total current, but it also limits lo local pressure gradients. So, for example, the pressure gradient as shown in H mode at the plasma edge is limited by an instability, and it's a ballooning mode. And the, the, in experiment, the gradient at the edge rises, 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 up till it encounters an MEC stability limit, and then this MEC stability will, will li locally limit the gradient. And as I said, this, these MEC stabilities are surprisingly well described by the MHD model. If you try to we can calculate very accurately these days linear MHD stability limits, so when the plasma moves from being stable to unstable, and compare that with experiments, we can predict that within 10% or so. And this is really, for plasma physics in tokamaks, really an extremely uh, accurate uh, number. So what are the instabilities we expect in ITER? Uh, first and foremost is disruptions. And part of disruptions are vertical displacement events. I will discuss this in, in a bit more detail because it's really the subject of highest priority at the moment for ITER. But it, what it does is it's a sudden termination of the plasma, uh, really within, uh, well, well, within a few milliseconds or more. So it leads to very high heat loads because the whole plasma energy is lost in, a, in an instant. And it leads also to very large mechanical forces. Then edge localized mode elms, uh, this is what I used to talk about a lot in the last few years, but not so much in this presentation. So there are the, the, the energy instabilities you get at the plasma edge due to the edge mode pedestal, as I tried to explain before. So these two are the really the, the dominant uh, uh, MHD instabilities of concern for ITER. The first one because it really has a large effect on the machine. The second one, elms, more because it leads to enhanced erosion of the inside of the machine so that we need to replace some parts of the machine uh, more often than was foreseen. There are quite a few other in some MHD instabilities, which we'll not discuss today. Uh, one is called neoclassical tearing modes. These are tearing modes of modes that form islands in the plasma, and the islands destroy locally the energy confinement. So what it, the result of neoclassical tearing modes is that it's, uh, there's a reduction in, in the energy in the plasma. And we cannot tolerate that if we want to obtain Q cos 10. Then there are salt teeth. Salt teeth are oscillations of the center of the plasma. Um, they are not so, they will occur and make, we can tolerate them without problems, I think. Then there are something, ex uh, what is called resistive, resistive wall modes. These modes will only occur in the second operation of ITER when we go to very high pressures in the plasma. That will drive particularly globally, will be global instabilities, but they grow on a very slow time scale and probably they can be controlled with magnetic field coils. And then, of course, uh, very uh, particular for ITER is that we, uh, well, we can expect, I, I don't know, because the, the, the question whether they will occur in ITER or not is, is not settled yet, but okay, it's certainly a question that can be investigated in ITER, which is. MHZ instabilities, which are driven by the fast particles themselves, so by the, by the alpha particles, they may destabilize what are called alpha and eigenmodes, which are modes which are normally stable, which are just waves in the plasma. But when you add a drive of fast particles, which are resonant with these modes, you can drive them unstable. 
and they would expel the fast particles and reduce the heating power from the alpha particles. Now, an important subject in ITER, and this is uh, very specific for ITER as well, uh, is the control of these instabilities. In, in present-day tokamaks, they, they try to control this, and they do control them, but they are not essential for the operation of a machine. In ITER, for the first time, it will be really essential to control these MSE instabilities. Because if you do not, then either the machine will, well, it will not break, but it will be damaged and needs to be repaired, or needs to be uh, yeah, repaired. So there are two reasons. There's one is for machine protection. Really, if you have disruptions, then that can lead to very high heat loads and mechanical loads. I will give some numbers later. Uh, so they need to be controlled, uh, either by avoiding them, by not operating close to dangerous limits, or by detecting them and plus shutting the plasma down before it occurs, or by doing something active. And the second reason is for, for performance optimization. I more or less said this already, but neoclassical terrain modes will be, need to be controlled if we want to keep, uh, we want to achieve Q plus 10 plasmas. And okay, the other modes also need to need to be controlled. So how do we control them? There are several, for each of these instabilities, there is a control method foreseen. Uh, so for disruptions, I will, uh, I should have maybe done the different order, I will explain <laughs> disruption in more detail later. But the control method is to inject a large amount of gas so that the energy of the plasma is radiated uh, to the walls, so, uh, and it's not coming to the walls uh, in, uh, in a particular place, in one place. Uh, it's either massive gas injection or massive material injection, so it's either a gas or a pellet that is injected, large argon pellets or deuterium pellets. Elms are controlled. This is particularly advanced this subject in the last few years. They can be controlled by applying resonant magnetic perturbations. So ITER will have 27 in-vessel coils. These are not part of the coils I've showed earlier. These are much smaller. They're living very small fields, but they are uh, of a helical nature inside the plasma. And they can stabilize elms, so they can uh, really uh, make the elms disappear. Another way to... Uh, control them is by injecting pellets. So very small pellets, up to uh, a millimeter cubed, but at high frequency. This more or less controls the elms by making them smaller. So they don't avoid them, but you make them so uh, fast that each elm will be small enough. And another way to control elms is to, uh, to apply vertical kicks, which is a bit cryptic maybe, but well, the way it's done is that you, you normally the plasma is stable, in a vertically stable position, but you can apply vertical kicks, means that you make the plasma oscillate like this, up and down, by a few centimeters. And this also uh, controls the elms, uh, so you can... <coughs> so this can be applied at low plasma current, so initially, at the initial operation of ITER, this can be applied, to, but not in the later full uh, operational phase. Then if you have neoclassical tearing modes, as I said, this will be controlled by electron cyclotron heating and current drive. So with electron cyclotron heating, you can locally apply a very uh, a current which is uh, localized inside the island uh, that is created by the tearing mode and in this way you can make the island shrink and disappear this is uh, a well, method is well known in in current uh, works very well in current tokamak so we are quite confident this will work so all these can be influenced by iron cyclotron heating in the center they may be, can be made uh, smaller if the if they uh, tend to get very large. And resistive wall modes can probably be controlled by the investor coils, the same coils that are uh, used for the ELM control. So now in a bit more detail, this was uh, rather global maybe, what is a disruption? Disruption is a sudden ter termination of the plasma. So if you see here as a function of time, the plasma current and the plasma energy, then you see that typically the plasma is healthy in H mode, then something already happens here that could be an MAG instability. The plasma decays to L mode, typically halves the plasma in, a f let's say, a few hundred milliseconds in ITER. But then in one to three milliseconds, all the whole plasma energy is lost in a very fast time scale. And this is due to, normally due to a very large MAG instability, which makes the plasma magnetic field uh, become ergodic over the whole plasma radius. So there's no thermal energy confinement anymore, and the whole plasma is lost. The, but I say the whole plasma is lost, but this is only the plasma energy part, so the, therm the kinetic energy part. So the, the density and te the temperature, the, the density typically stays, the density, the temperature goes from, 
well, let's say it was 30 kV here in the center to, to 10 here and then to 100 eV here. So we lost all the thermal energy in, in a few milliseconds. But the plasma current cannot react like that. It's an it's a, it's a electrical circuit. It cannot decay so quickly. So the current quench, the decay of the current, will go much slower. Uh, and okay, I'll come back to this. Um, oh, <laughs> I have competition. <laughs> All audience. <laughs> okay, have a good one. <laughs> So the, 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 so the the temperature goes down very quickly here. That means that the plasma resistivity goes to a very large value. And that means that a large electric field is created in this phase. And that means that you, uh, the large electric field can drive electrons, fast electrons, which is called the runaway current. I will come back to this. Uh, which are driven uh, in this phase. And these are very dangerous for it. Where is he? Ah, he went away. <laughs> Not interested. Uh, yeah. So the, the time scales are the, the thermal loads during the thermal quench. Uh, the, the thermal loads are the largest during the thermal quench. So the thermal loads means the energy that is the plasma energy deposited on the wall uh, is during this time. But uh, the current quench, of course, is the magnetic forces. Oh, the magnetic forces are the largest during the current quench, which is on a time scale of 50 to 150 milliseconds. Oh, I should speed up maybe a bit. So, as I said, the heat loads are, are the, the, during the thermal quench, uh, th yeah, the thermal quench, where 350 megajoule of plasma energy spreads over typically 10 to 30 square meters in a few milliseconds. And it gives uh, thermal loads, which are expressed typically in this, fac in this fashion. It's the energy lost divided by the area over which you lose it, uh, divided by the square root of the time. And this gives a, an energy, which is a heat load factor of 100 to 2000 with all the uncertainties. But if you look at the diverter, this made of tungsten, it melts at 50. So we're about a factor of 2 to 40 over the melting limit uh, of, the, of the inside of the machine. So that means a disruption like this you cannot tolerate. You need to control it, you need to mitigate it, you need to do something. And one way to mitigate it is to inject uh, large amounts of gas. This gas will radiate the energy of the plasma, not to the, to the 10 to 30 meters, but to the whole inside of the machine, to the 800 square meters. And in that way, you can go below the, the melting limit of, of tungsten. In fact, then you will spread it over the inside of the machine, not over in the diverter in the bottom. But the whole machine, and the whole machine is made of beryllium. The, the rest of the machine is made of beryllium inside. So you need to stay below the melting limit of beryllium. Uh, as I said, this can be done by gas or by uh, injecting of uh, pellets. And one of the main questions is, in fact, how to obtain a homogeneous distribution of radiation. Because when you inject gas, you do it from a valve, which is very localized. This is a, a few centimeters, let's say 10 centimeters squared. Uh, so the, you need to distribute the gas over the whole volume when it starts radiating. Otherwise, you get a, a local hotspot and locally melt the wall anyway. This is one, uh, one of the big con concerns. And it turns out that the, the, the pattern of radiation is dominated by the MHD activity inside the plasma. Because it's, you inject the gas, but the, there is already MHD activity, which will distribute the gas much quicker than it would normally do. So the, the, peaking, the radiation profile, the peaking factor of it is really determined by the MHD activity. Then there's one <coughs> particular well, type of disruption, which is called the vertical displacement event. You may know that any plasma that is elongated in a toroidal system, like uh, the, the normal ether plasmas here on the, on the left, is vertically unstable. So all the time during the plasma operation, the whole 500 seconds, it needs to be controlled. It needs to be kept into position with uh, active uh, steering of the magnetic field coils. This is normal. This is done in all tokamaks, and this is uh, standard. But uh, there are limits to this control system. And in ITER, we can, we can control. So if you would, in ITER, move the plasma by, by magic 16 centimeters up, you can still control it. So you can push it back to its original position. But if something happens and it moves up by more than 16 centimeters, 
we lose control and then the plasma moves by itself uh, for, according to these pictures here. So in, in this case it's vertically unstable towards the top and you can imagine that what happens when you, the plasma touches the top wall, you get a very low local heat load but you also get a disruption at some point and the disruption is typically, oops, no, uh, typically before between the last two frames. So really quite late. So these vertical displacement events uh, lead to also to very large heat loads and also well, particularly large mechanical uh, loads. Uh, do I say it here? <coughs> no. Okay. So the, the time scale of this instability is due to it needs it's, um, the whole global magnetic field is moving up. So the plasma magnetic field is moving up, and it needs to move through the metallic wall. Uh, so through the, the vacuum. Oh, so through this, uh, the, there's a metallic wall, the vacuum vessel. So the magnetic field needs to diffuse through this wall. It cannot just happen by, by instantly, instantaneously. So the, the time scale of typically 150, 150 to 150 milliseconds is determined by the resistive diffusion through the, through, the, through the wall. So it's really a relatively slow process. And then uh, <coughs> a bit more detail of what happens during the VDE. Uh, so if you move so th this is particularly about currents that are flowing inside the wall. So when you move the plasma current up, it, you have a movement of magnetic field, and this induces a current close to the plasma inside the first conducting layer, which are the blanket modules here. So there will be a f large force due to eddy currents, so induced currents, and which, have a, which can rip off these parts of the wall if they are too big. There's another current that can be induced, which are called halo currents which are currents which are really, they used to be inside the plasma, but now the plasma is moved into the wall. So parts of the plasma current will now flow into the wall here. So there will be large forces on the, on the vessel, on the metallic structure, which will, should not be there, uh, from just from the current here and the magnetic field here, we've got a large vertical force. And these forces can be up to 100 tons, which is really extremely large. So the mechanical structure of ITER is, is made strong enough that it can support these forces. But okay, you shouldn't do that uh, too often. And then a uh, particular concern for ITER is what is called asymmetric VDEs. And this happens when you have a, during the vertical displacement event, the plasma moves up slowly, uh, when the secondary instability develops. And this is very likely to occur because the, when the plasma moves up, the, the current uh, stays high relative to the magnetic field, and the plasma shrinks, and it, drives you into an unstable position to external kink mode. So now you see that, uh, for example, the halo currents here are shared here with the wall, but because uh, an, the secondary instability makes the plasma tilt like this, the current sharing does not occur on this side. Oops. Uh, okay, so on the left side, you don't have current sharing, so you have a force on the right side on the machine, but not on the left. So there's a force, large force, which tends to tilt the machine. And this is a large force that needs to be uh, avoided at that uh, needs to be avoided. <laughs> so the, this is a relatively new observation in tokamak plasmas, and the physics basis, so the explanations for it, or so when it is expected to occur, is really not very well known as uh, one of the highest priority for ITER research at the moment. Then I said uh, I already started to explain a bit what runaway electrons are. These are also uh, well, it seems we have many problems, but. <laughs> uh, so runaway electrons are created uh, during the current quench, when the plasma temperature has gone down from uh, thousands of e electron volts to, to 100 electron volts typically, that creates a large electric field and this electric field can drive fast electrons. And this is because the friction an electron uh, sees when it moves through the, through the plasma, it decays with its, plasma, with its energy. So if you add more energy to an electron, <coughs> the friction it feels gets less and less. So the final solution is to have in a high electric field is to that the plasma creates a, a beam of fast electrons. They typically have an energy up to 20 uh, mega electron volt in ether, and the current can be up to 10 mega amperes. So most of the plasma current is carried by these fast electrons, and there's really a, a tight beam, tight, it's a beam it's expected to be it's this size, with lots of uh, energy. It has 10 megajoule of kinetic energy, but it has 200 megajoule of, of uh, magnetic energy. And if this beam, by some cause, is not confined, and is not likely to be confined, it will strike the first wall. 
and this can lead to to very deep melting of the beryllium first of all one of the main question is how you how you lose the energy in fact it's easy to see how you when a plasma strikes the wall that the kinetic energy is lost so the, but the the it's not so clear how you lose the magnetic energy of the beam and the fraction is the question is how much of the magnetic energy is lost uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and how, in fact. So the runaway electrons must also be controlled. The maximum current we can allow is about 2 megaamperes, And this is also done by injecting massive amounts of gas. Uh, but the amount of gas you need to control the runaway electrons is about a factor of 10 to 100 more than you need for the disruption control. It's about 10 to the 25 particles uh, you need to inject. Uh, I don't know if that is a number that says any. <laughs> okay, I will run over a bit. Uh, so the MAG equation, so now we come to the introduction of the, uh, of the simulations. So these are the equations we want to solve. I, think, I guess you all know them. Uh, the evolution equation of the density, the velocity or momentum, temperature and magnetic field. And we typically don't use the magnetic field, but the uh, vector potential for the evolution. <coughs> what particularly the model we use is a simplified version of the full MAG model, which is called the reduced MAG model. And its simplest explanation is to just to pose uh, as an ansatz the velocity field as a potential field and the parallel velocity. And the magnetic field is posed as being part made out of a, a fixed toroidal field. Yeah. So F0 over R is the fixed toroidal field and a varying poloidal field. So the toroidal field is the long way around the torus and the poloidal field is the short way around. And then you can just insert these in the equations we had before, and then you get these equations for the poloidal flux, the parallel momentum, the poloidal momentum, the temperature and density. And these are the equations that we actually solve in the in well in our simulation code. In fact, we solve also the full MAG model, but for all practical applications, the reduced MAG model is accurate enough and, and is much easier to solve. So what are the boundary conditions? They become uh, uh, more complicated in the tokamak compared to maybe other applications. Because there is an interaction of the plasma with the wall, the plasma touches the wall somewhere. Uh, this creates a, a sheet. I don't know if people know about the plasma sheet. I assume they do. People do. Okay, but this is the sheet that develops because electrons are lost, uh, have a high, uh, higher velocity, so they're lost easier to the, to the wall and absorbed. And then the electric field is locally created just very close to the wall. And this sheet, in fact, determines the boundary conditions that need to be applied. So the resulting boundary conditions are that the parallel velocity driving into the wall must be the sound speed, or larger than the sound speed. There's also a condition on the total energy flux in the parallel direction, so parallel to the magnetic field, which is exp expressed like this. You know. So the convective and TV and conductive part, kappa parallel, grad parallel T, needs to be a factor, a factor typically 8, gamma sheet, it's called here, times the convect, uh, conductive energy. And there's also a condition on the electric potential. More complicated in the tokamak plasma simulations is the boundary conditions for the magnetic field. The simplest one is to assume that there's an ideal wall around the plasma, but this is not very, uh, very uh, relevant uh, for most of the applications. So for most applications, we need to do a free boundary calculation, what is called free boundary. So you need to solve the magnetic field evolution, not just inside the plasma, not inside the torus, but up to infinity. And also include all the, the resistive walls and coils and, and things. So now I come to the code we use. It's called YOEC for no particular reason. Well, no reason that should not be mentioned here. Um, so the initial motivation for the development of this code is, uh, well, this is now... Uh, 10 years ago, maybe already, is, was the simulations of ELMS, uh, edge localized mode, as I mentioned before. And th that made some requirements to the code, so it needs to be in toroidal geometry, it needs to be accurate, accurately describing the plasma shape. And what was new at the time is that it includes both open and closed field lines. Here you see a typical grid of the code. So this is, the, I cannot point to. So the, the plasma center where they have closed field lines and open field lines outside the, the the plas main plasma, and the, the particular part, the particular property of York is that we align the finite elements that we use uh, onto the magnetic field structure. And you see also that the magnetic, the f these are the plot of the, of the finite elements, that they are curved in space. So 
Uh, uh, I'll come back to that if I have time. I don't have time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so initially we were developed the code for edge localized mode simulations. Now it's becoming more and more a general MAZ code, which can study all the, the the issues for ITER, for example, that I mentioned. Also, the development of the code has become a large team effort with uh, people from all over Europe, and now also some Russian participation. The characteristics, as I already said, is that we use uh, Bezier finite elements, so cubic finite elements, which are C1 continuous, which are basically Hermit cubic finite elements, but allow refinement, that's really. In the, in the throttle direction, we use a real Fourier series. Uh, people can ask me later why we use real instead of complex Fourier series. We use a fully implicit time evolution, and this is because the time scales of, uh, of the MAG equations is, is typically alpha in time. But if you want to simulate a vertical displacement event, that's a typically, let's say, up to 100 milliseconds. And the difference in time scale is uh, alpha in time is five or half a microsecond, typically. And you want to simulate 100 milliseconds. So you have a very strong uh, disparity between the time scales. And that's why we use a fully implicit time evolution, where we use pastis as a sparse matrix solver in this, uh, uh, to solve the, the, the time stepping. The parallelization is done with MPI OpenMP, and we now typically run up to 2,000 processes, not more. I will skip this part. Uh, this is, was an introduction on the finite elements we use. Uh, this part I skipped. Convergence is uh, just to show that we have studied the convergence. Uh, is that, uh, for example, here the growth rate of an MEG instability, and it's, in fact, it's the instability is an internal kink which is responsible for sorties in tokamaks. What you see here is the a graphical representation, let's say, of the displacement of the plasma core. So the core is displacing inside a particular surface, and the outside is unperturbed. And we can calculate the growth rate uh, as a function of, well, the error in the growth rate as a function of the grid size. And we see that it scales with the fifth power of the, of the grid size, which is the expected uh, high order convergence of the, of the growth rate. <laughs> okay. The representation is the the perturbed poloidal flux. And the colors the the colors just are random coloring the finite elements. Just just to show which or no. <laughs> it's a no 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 no. It's just to show the uh, Yeah, exactly. Well the solution is supposed to be flat both outside and inside, with a boundary layer between the two. So this way you see that it's really flat inside, because, oh, okay, uh, I'm not. It's just to, just to be nice. Maybe uh, I'd spend a few slides on stabilization, because this is quite a, an important uh, ingredient. Um, the MHD equations as we solve them are numerically not uh, very stable if in the presence of large flows. I should say that in the MHD simulations this is not very common. Normally in MHD the dominant Movements are the movement of a magnetic field, and the flows are typically they look quite s much smaller than Mach 1. Okay, but there are applications like the injection of pellets uh, where the plasma starts to move with the sound velocity. And for these applications, we developed, or not developed, we applied uh, known stabilization techniques. And the one I will try to uh, present here is the Taylor Gerlaking 2 TG2 method that we have implemented in the code. Here's just a test case, which is a uh, vortex mix mixing. So there are two vortices initially, and they rotate and merge into one. And if you do this without stabilization, with 51 finite elements, it's also the equation we solve it is from here. It's, just this, it's very similar to one of the equations in MHG, but it's just the, the vortex that we solve. And you see that it doesn't work very well. It's very noisy and very, uh, well, noisy. So the Taylor lacking stabilization, just in short, I'll try to explain, is using the an, uh, the second line here. I cannot point. The second line where you see W n plus one is W n plus a time series. Normally we stop at the, the first delta t, but you can include the other delta t's. And you, you can rewrite the delta t, the second one, so say the delta t squared term, as a part of the original equation. So. Uh, Pointing would be useful. No. <laughs> uh, so the, the the fourth line, 
basically replaces the time derivative of a part of your term with another term which is the original equation. And this gives you a new equation which is still consistent, but now second order in time, well, with delta t squared terms, and these are terms are stabilizing. I'm sorry, we can discuss later if people are interested. And this gives a very large improvement uh, for the particular test case. Now if you see the original picture with the, the new picture, then the new uh, picture is very much smoother. Of course, it introduces uh, a large viscosity and maybe you can, uh, maybe in this case it's even too large because you see the, the solutions are not really the same. And if you go to a uh, larger resolution, then you see that there, in fact, at a larger resolution we don't need the stabilization, we get nice smooth solutions. Now with 200 uh, by 200 finite elements. And if you apply the stabilization, you could think that the stabilization is too strong and that it just smooths uh, too much the solution. But okay, anyway, we have implemented this stabilization method and it's used for some of the applications. Uh, in some of the applications, it's essential to, to be used, otherwise it just doesn't run. The activities now these days, uh, as I said, the York team is uh, working on a large set of subjects. People at CEA are working on disruption simulations and injection of massive gas. People are working on ELM simulations also at CEA, but also in, uh, in Garching. Uh, we work on ELM control, this is something I do myself, injection of pellets, which I pay for the from Barcelona. Other ELM control methods, Q, uh, which is called the QH mode, which I'll discuss later. And then tearing mode control is done at FOM in Holland. Vertical displacements event we started to simulate now, just uh, last year. There's also being done num numerical work being done on the numerical schemes by people in Gaging mostly, and also in Nice. And work is going on on the equations themselves, so we try to improve the MHZ model towards more and more realistic models. I will discuss this here. <laughs> I will run over a bit, but uh, this is uh, the new developments, recent developments. Uh, and one of the, as I said, we need to solve the MHG equations not just inside the plasma, but we need to take into account the complicated metal structures just all around the plasma because the magnetic field perturbations are not local, they induce currents in all the resistive structures, all locally currents. And this needs to be taken into account. Currently this is not done uh, uh, at all, uh, well, or in a very simplified manner, let's say. So the equations we need to solve is uh, in the plasma, you have an electric field. This, this has two components. There's an electric potential and a time-varying uh, vector potential. So the one is responsible for the, what I call halo currents, is the, the electric potential, and the delta T is the eddy currents. In the conducting structures, you just need to solve Ohm's law, simple. And in the vacuum, you need to solve that uh, diff P is zero and rotation of V is zero. So how do we solve that? In fact, we split the system in two, which is very uh, computationally attractive. We have one code which solves the, everything outside the plasma, and it needs to be done only once because it's assumed to be linear. So the, the response of the outside the plasma, so let's say magnetic perturbation you make inside the plasma will perturb currents outside in the, in the walls, but this response is linear. So you need to solve that only once. So there is a code from, from IPP Garching called Starwall, which solves the magnetic field equations outside in the, in the conducting structures. And this gives back a boundary condition for Yorick for the code that solves the inside. So in fact, what we, what we get from Starwall is a, is a relation between the normal component of the magnetic field to the tangential component. And this is expressed in a series of matrices here, only represented by, by M. And then in the weak form of the equations that we use to solve the MSG equations, you can ins insert this into the boundary conditions, and then you buy automatically uh, uh, satisfy these boundary conditions. And this way we can solve for the eddy currents out in the structures outside the field. This uh, scheme works very well, except that it for the moment only works for the eddy currents, and a new scheme for halo currents is, is required, and work is being done in Gaging to, to solve this problem as well. So all this introduction was to come in the end to some applications. Here is an example of a VDE simulation. It, oops, it's very simple, in fact, uh, don't be disappointed. It's just the, the plasma, and you see it moving up. And it's moving up, so the, and what you see also is the, 
the vacuum vessel, a simplified representation of the vacuum vessel, so the conducting structure on the outside, and the current flowing in the outside. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this, uh, <laughs> this simulation, but uh, this now allows to, to simulate VDEs in ITER with realistic parameters for the, for the resistivity of the wall and the resistivity in the plasma. And this is really a first uh, ever. As I said, one of the important uh, issues for ITER is a 3D VDE, so where the VDE itself becomes unstable. Just last week, we got the first result on that. So this now is a, a VDE, a vertical displacement. You see the plasma moving up a little bit. And at the same time, developing inside the plasma a secondary instability. So these are the current due to the secondary instability. And in the end, uh, we need to continue this further, but it's, it's a difficult simulation. In the end, it will deform the plasma into a 3D shape and uh, cause uh, the forces on the, on the wall, which we then finally can calculate. Hope, well, hopefully. Then I have uh, just five minutes to introduce you a, a completely new subject. Uh, so I've talked to you about, about ELMS. Uh, I mentioned it uh, now and again, that ELMS are a problem. So and the control methods that were foreseen are the applying external, field, external magnetic field perturbation or pellets. But there is a third option, which is not officially in the program, but is being developed in tokamaks uh, around the world. And this is called QH mode plasmas. In fact, what you do is... Uh, Instead of applying an electric field and magnetic field perturbation with coils, you make the plasma unstable. You force the plasma to become a little bit unstable. So then the plasma itself will make uh, a 3D field perturbation, and this avoids the edge localized mode. This is, of course, a very elegant solution if you are certain that you can control the MSC's instability that you that you uh, that you made yourself in inside the plasma. And so these plasmas are called QH mode for quiescent H mode, so H mode without ELMS. And they can be run for a long time. This is an example of D3D for, well, this is a smaller tokamak, so the long is in several seconds here. And you see here at the bottom plot which, what is experimentally called an edge harmonic oscillation. This is the MHG instability induced in the plasma, uh, which typically has time traces of frequency and time like this. So this is a a, a, possible, a possible alternative for ITER operation. It's not in the official baseline, but we're investigating whether we can understand this, whether we can simulate this, and whether we can predict this, what will happen in ITER, whether we can apply this in ITER, this regime. So the, we try to simulate this, and in fact, what we simulate here is a D3D plasma, so the American tokamak, where they actually did most of the experiments. We take one of their plasmas, and take that as an initial state, and we just let the simulation run. And then we see what happens is that an instability develops as an experiment. In fact, it's very similar to experiment. It's rotating, rotating with typically a few kilohertz. And it will do this forever. It's steady state. It's a stationary state. Uh, so it's a 3D plasma now with uh, n equals 1 throttle perturbation. You can see on the, on the right the time evolution of the mag magnetic energy of the perturbations. You see it starts with a total mode number of n equals 5, but eventually it, it leads to a saturated state where the total mode number 1 is the dominant mode number. So this, this, is, the, this is what we think is the, the edge harmonic oscillation that is observed experimentally. And uh, okay. the structure agrees with the experiment and also the frequencies uh, are very similar. So this is the, f the perturbed magnetic field. It's really quite small, huh? it's uh, to 10 to the minus 3 or so of the equilibrium field. Then just to show you another one what happens. So the reason why uh, QH on plasmas don't have ELMS is because the instability you induce reduces the magnetic energy, the thermal energy confinement. So instead of ELMS to regulate the pressure gradient at the edge, you now have another instability to regulate the pressure gradient. And it keeps the pressure gradient under the MAZ stability limit for ELMS. And how it does that is by, by making specific losses to the density profile. If you look at the density profile, it, it looks like this. And so this is a cut through the plasma. You see the radius and the density. You see the, when the plasma is rotating, uh, the motor, when stability is rotating, you see the, the density is moving in and out. And this movement of the plasma, in fact, leads to an increase in density losses, and typically we lose about 10% of the total density. And it, it controls the density, so if you cannot increase the density anymore. The temperature is not so much infected. Okay, this was uh, 
a short part of the of the recent applications. Then the future directions. Um, the aim really is to do MHD simulations in ether to try to to create a, or to in, to improve the physics basis of these uh, the understanding of these uh, instabilities. So we can extrapolate from current experiments to to ether parameters. The two dominant applications are disruptions, as I tried to explain in Elms. For that, we need extended MHD models. It's clear that the models that I shown you, which is a resistive MHD model, is too simple. It, uh, it, it lacks certain ingredients which are important to describe the, the, the real experiments. Uh, one big term, for example, is the diamagnetic velocity, which needs to be included. But also other features like bootstrap current and gyro viscosity and things like that. So there, there is an effort to extend the models. And this can either be starting from reduced MHG, but uh, if you ask me, we should go to, to full MHG. And the two models, of course, should be compared. Uh, important development should be the inclusion of radiating impurities. As I said, injection of gas is one of the main control methods. So we need to simulate the interaction of the injected gas with the MHG instabilities. This is something that is just starting. This is not uh, very common yet. Then we need to include the halo currents, the interaction with particles, so interaction with runaway electrons, for example, but also the interaction with uh, the alphas, so the fusion-produced particles and impurities. And of course, uh, although the code works uh, relatively well at the moment, to really go to much higher resolution that we can do at the moment, we need developments on the numerics as well. One of them is to go to 3D finite elements for the whole of the torus, go to higher order splines. Uh, we need better solvers and better scalability. So that's enough work for a large team of persons. In conclusion, this is more or less what I said already. Uh, MHD, in fact, is uh, related. Well, let's say the high priority ether issues are related to MHD instabilities. There are other high priority issues, but the, pl the issues tom coming from the plasma part are really MHD related. And they're related to disruptions and ELMS and their control. Uh, for that, we need uh, validation of MHG simulation on current experiments for extrapolation to ETA. And okay, and the last point is what I just said in the earlier slide, that we need to go to more and more realistic simulations to really try to uh, describe um, in more detail the, uh, the reality, the experiment. Thank you very much for your attention.